Welcome to Writer's Digest Presents. Hosted by the editors of Writer's Digest, this monthly podcast features conversations with writing and publishing experts whose insights will help ignite your creative vision, hone your skills, build your platform, and get your work out into the world. Welcome to Writer's Digest Presents. I'm Editor-in-Chief Amy Jones, alongside Editor Michael Woodson. Today we are discussing our summer book club pick, but this one is a little bit different. Usually we pick a book that's been recently released so you can all read along with us, but this book isn't quite out yet, but we loved it so much we had to make it our book club selection. So let this act as a reminder to put this book on your TBR pile when it comes out August 1st. It's Mobility by Lydia Kiesling, and we are so excited to have her with us on the podcast today. Lydia, welcome to Writer's Digest. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here, and I'm so grateful to you for um, doing like an advanced preview of my book. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad that you allowed us to do an advanced preview. It's um, it's a great pick. And before we get started, could you um, tell our listeners a little bit about mobility? Yes. So mobility is um, essentially a coming of age novel, but it's also a work novel, and it follows um, the protagonist or Right, you know, the main character, let's say, um, Bunny Glenn from her teenage years when she's living overseas with her foreign service family to her kind of later middle age um, when she's made a career for herself in the oil and gas industry. Yeah. And also for listeners, this is uh, because it's not quite out yet, probably while you're listening to this, we won't really spoil anything as best we can. Um, but Lydia, what would you say was like the in- initial inspiration for this book? I think I started out. Um, you're gonna see. I'm sorry, you're gonna see my cat's tail Perfect. probably oh, like <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Welcome my dog, to my house. Amy's cats. Yeah, yep. <laughs> the cat is just like I. I must wedge myself in here. Oh, um, yeah, of course. So yeah, I I um, grew up in the foreign service, and you know we had several postings overseas when I was a child and teenager, and so I was initially interested in kind of fictionalizing that experience of being a teenager, which, you know, I think that's a period for anybody of often Mm -hmm. feeling a little bit of sort of alienation and weirdness and awkwardness. Um, But it takes on a peculiar or particular kind of um, valence when you are in a place that's unfamiliar to you. So I started out, you know, thinking about a character who had that kind of upbringing. And then I was thinking about how um, when you are, you know, living, quote unquote, overseas, like in the service of some sort of particularly like a government um, type of enterprise, whether it's like the foreign service, the military, there's really a particular kind of tenor and quality to Mm. your experience of being overseas. Um, It's often like very insular. There's a sense of kind of... um, American supremacy, let's put it that Mm. way, um, often. And so, you know, that was fundamentally going to be a part of whatever, you know, fictional scenario I came up with. Um, And then as I started to think about the time and place, and I did want to talk about a a time and more or less a place that was kind of familiar to my own experience, um, I was reading about the region of the Caucasus and the, you know, newly, re- relatively newly independent former Soviet Union, um, the various countries that came into being, and then this sort of scramble by um, multinational corporations and then kind of weird freelance mercenaries to mm. flood into these places and try and like get a hold on all of the resources that had hitherto been, you know, kind of out of reach. And in the case of countries like Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan, it was oil reserves. So then I, I sort of went off on a tangent um, learning about that. And that's, you know, I went on some like kind of wild paths for a while, but then took it back to, you know, my main character, this teenager, and then figured out a way to weave those currents sort of together into one story, which mm-hmm. took a lot longer <laughs> to do than it took me to describe. <laughs> no. Well, I- I, I want to go back to the oil um, in your research in a little bit. But first, I wanted to, th- I, I was thinking about the timeline of mm-hmm. this book compared to your first book, The Golden State, which follows 10 days in the life of a young mother. But mobility sort of spans a very long 
part of Bunny's life. What kind of challenges did that did both of those kinds of timelines present, and what did you enjoy about each time frame? That is a great question. Um, I think in both cases, the time scale um, was actually like solving a narrative problem for me. Mm. So in the case of the Golden State, when I started writing, I really didn't have a story. I had kind of a scenario. I had a character and sort of a, a, a way of feeling and a type of experience, namely that of caregiving and sort of the day-to-day minute-to-minute of looking after a small child um, and then certain types of kind of personal and professional frustrations and an interest in a particular place but I didn't have a way that those cohered into some story that you know followed some you know three-act structure whatever Mm. (laughs) however many acts it's supposed to have I actually I'm like not sure that that's even the right number but so (laughs) I I was really flailing and so one of the ways that I kind of constrained myself and gave myself some um, parameters that would help me be kind of productive and not feel so at sea um, Mm -hmm. was to just say, okay, it's 10 days. So whatever's going to happen in the story, Mm -hmm. you know, um, obviously with the exception of any sort of exposition or backstory, but any, any events need to take place in these 10 days. And that's basically going to be how the book is separated. So it was a little bit of like a, you know, a a ploy um, to make myself write the book and to just kind of um, put it in compartments. And I, my thought, you know, was like, well, I can always go back and change it, but this will just give me like a basic structure. And in the end, I was like, nope, this is the structure. This is how I can write the book. And then with mobility, um, having those really long, so the book, yeah, takes place over many, many years, but also jumps through time, like pretty always moving forward but it's pretty almost um arbitrary feeling you know what year Mm. you're going to move to and how Mm -hmm. much time you spend in each year um sometimes you spend you know a long time and other times it's just a few pages Mm -hmm. and that too was solving a little bit of a narrative problem because then i knew that i was interested in character development and sort of what are ultimately like pretty mundane experiences of just like working in a job or, you know, developing feelings around sort of ambition or personal politics. And those aren't things that I knew really how to put in a very plotty plot. Um, Mm. And so, you know, having it stretch over a lot of time allowed me to just stretch myself a bit and give myself space to just show the character doing different things. And I think jumping forward in time, especially skipping years at a time, automatically adds like a little bit of narrative mystery and momentum because the reader knows. Yeah. yeah, Like my hope was that the reader knows like, okay, we're moving forward for some reason. What is the reason? I sometimes worry that I was just like tricking the reader. (laughs) Like (laughs) just like, Hey, you're just going to read like for a long time. And, but you know, don't expect something big to happen, but in the end, you know, events actually are, you know, I think there's like sort of an inexorable quality that happens with the human life you know, just individually, but then mm-hmm. also the feeling that we, I think, are all living with um, on planet Earth right now. And so yeah. it did sort of naturally, I, I felt gimmicky at first, but then it ended up being very helpful as a way to just sort of move my story forward and figure out what my story even was. Wow. I I love that you mentioned um, mundane because I do actually, it's like one of my favorite things about your work is is that like these minute moments create such intense world building and um, it like they are seemingly unimportant details, but they end up holding a lot of narrative weight. And so that like you said, like when the point of the book kind of reveals itself, it it really feels like a surprise. Um, I felt this way with the Golden State as well, but I'm curious at, at what point in this writing process do you start to think about how these details um, will build a complete story? That is also a great question. Um, I think they start out just being my, um, my kind of like preoccupations and my, my sense of being in the world as a person myself and just, you know, kind of all the moments we're all like acting out our own little personal dramas, like every minute of the day. Uh, and you know, depending on what level of like main character syndrome (laughs) you might have, um, you know, you might sort of, sometimes zoom out and 
mm. be like, wow, the, you know, this, this moment like has a lot of weight for me, but it's just not that important in the scheme of things. And I think everyone sort of has those just kind of going through life. Um, and yeah, if you just kind of think about like, especially something like a workplace problem, mm -hmm. you know, that someone might have, it takes on enormous weight and, you know, sometimes in a silly way, but it's very consequential if you consider that that's how most people spend their lives, you know, day to day. So yeah, interpersonal like neighbor battles or family struggles, all mm -hmm. of those things really become important. So I'm just so interested in the narrative challenge of capturing some of those dynamics and moments in a way that is if not interesting, at least like bearable for the reader. And I think the golden state was like a much bigger challenge on that front because I was very obsessed with the kind of caregiving portion. And so mm. the toddler is a big feature in the golden state and like the mom handling the toddler is a big part of the story. And, and some people, you know, told me some pe people who like, like me were even like, I actually could not like deal with <laughs> Wow. With, those, with those details which and it was often it was sometimes it was people who were like themselves in a moment of intense kind of caregiving like had little babies and were just like no right. I don't need this like from my fictional experience right now so um I think with mobility I had there was less of that type of challenge, but I was, I mean, I remember my agent made me cut out a bunch of stuff about Microsoft Word and I was like, no, I, Microsoft Word is like one of the great like stages of our <laughs> modern dramas. Um, I did keep in like things about my, I insist, I was like, Microsoft Word has to be in this book, but maybe not like so many pages. Um, so yeah, those things are important to me. And then like, but yes, at a certain point, there does have to be sort of something else that or, mm. or something that just kind of like ties them together and not to sound like completely you know woo about it but I do think books especially if you spend enough time with them they will develop a logic of their own and so sometimes you notice things happening at the end or someone else notices for you and then you're like oh yeah I was doing that I didn't really mm. realize um or yeah maybe it's just kind of at whatever season in your life you're thinking about a certain, you have a certain set of preoccupations. And so they all will kind of lead back to one another. Um, mm. And yeah, so for mobility, a lot of the things I, you know, th I think a lot about kind of like gender dy dynamics and like hierarchies and power, like how people want power and like, what are the ways that you um, sort of ally yourself with it or try to like get it for yourself. And so, yeah. and that kind of ripples into a lot of different scenarios and, I didn't really notice. And I mean, I was consciously thinking about it, but um, afterwards you're like, Oh, good job. Like you were, <laughs> you were like, there was a way that you were trying to tie those together in your, in your subconscious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have a lot of follow-up questions to what you just said. We'll get to them. But first I have to say, I have lived that Microsoft Word experience. <laughs> the one that Bunny lived where she, like, who in the office has this document open? Are they overriding what I'm doing? How can we prevent this from happening? <laughs> I have lived that. I have had books ruined. Like when I was working on, when I was editing books, Oh God. it was bad. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, document hygiene is very important. Yeah. It, yeah. it is. <laughs> um, so connecting with these minute details, I think this really hits on something that Michael and I have both talked about with your work and that I really appreciate is you have the ability to make like these very keen observations about life. And there was there's one just one great example from mobility that um aside from the Microsoft Word, <laughs> really resonated with me. It's when Bunny goes back to Baku as an adult and she's at this conference and she, the day is over, but they have some time to explore the city and she runs into the host of the conference and the host offers to show her around and Bunny feels this, like she's being nice. She's offering mm -hmm. to take me and show me the city. It feels like an ob like she's doing it out of an obligation, but I feel obligated to say yes, but I really okay. just want to go back to my hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder, do you, are those the kinds of things that you make? Like I have a little notes app on my phone where I write down funny things that have happened. So I remember them, but are these the kind of things that you think about in your life and write them down and find a way to use them in your work? Or are they born out of the characters as you are creating them in their interior thoughts? Wow. That's such a, I, it's like, I, I love the, um, the sort of that the either or of that question, because I mean, you know, obviously, like, 
funny is not me, but you know, part of, we, we have to share some DNA in sure. order for, mm -hmm. especially because, you know, like demographically speaking, we're so close. So in some respects, like her experiences or her kind of like constellation of experiences are mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in that sense, that moment um, when she's sort of, to me, that's like I growing up, you know, in, and living overseas. And then when I was a young adult, I um, lived in Turkey and, um, I feel like one of the kind of great, like cross cultural tragedies is that moment mm. when, when you're trying to like second and third guess what someone wants to be mm -hmm. doing, um, <laughs> and mm -hmm. whether you are like disappointing or not sure. disappointing. And, um, so I've definitely, that is just an experience that I've had that I think, you know, sometimes your characters do become this repository where you can be like, mm. well, I'm going to put this in. So, you know, with the golden state, again, a character who, was not me in some very important ways, but we shared DNA. And, and, and what's funny is that like, I think of the narrator of the golden state and bunny as being very, they're kind of like two paths for a, mm. a person. They, they really like, aren't that similar, but, but because they, you know, have this sort of like shared DNA um, of me, <laughs> the author, you know, there are some similarities and I, yeah, I feel like with Daphne, I would just, you know, it's like Daphne works in a university and I worked in a university. So it was my, I could just like stick in some little like things that annoyed me about, about my workplace. So, you know, that there, it's a kind of a combination of like, well, this fits with what I think of the character, but it's also my opportunity to just like finally have someone hear my opinion on this, like, you know, mostly irrelevant thing, just because, <laughs> you know, it's just like a thought that you have. And that is, I mean, not, not to be like novels are like a perfect vehicle for narcissists, but, um, <laughs> but, they, but they are, you know, whenever you're writing one, you're like, this could be the last book I ever write. Totally. Like prob probably will be. So I better like put all the things that, you know, rattle around my brain. Oh, wow. Um, That's interesting. And then, you know, a lot of times you read over and you're like, well, that we can take out like many of these, but, um, but for the ones that, that do end up fitting the character, you're like, great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You were talking about sharing some of the same DNA as Bunny because you're like relatively close, um, you know, in, in an age, I would assume. Yeah. And I'm almost the same age as Bunny. Like I and so her life choices and just the way her life played out felt very, very familiar to me, like particularly those early years. In mm -hmm. the workforce, you know, yes. graduating <laughs> with an English degree in, mm. right in the middle of the Great Recession. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and what are you going to do with that? And then when you do find work, trying desperately to hold on to that job and make yourself like, invaluable mm -hmm. so that you <laughs> can eventually some point find your own place to live. <laughs> <laughs> like it, so much of, of that really resonated with me. And I mean, maybe it is because if you're, of a similar age, it was kind of your experience too, but could you talk about how you honed the depth of those details mm. and her th thoughts about those kinds of things from the character creation perspective? Certainly. So I'd say that, so that it's in, like, you know, when I started writing the book, I was like thinking about teenage bunny. And then mm. I, I do think that sometimes writing novels is like a way, I, a phrase I've used in the past is like, expelling the hairballs from your psyche but you're kind of like <laughs> often processing something that you know a time, something five or ten years ago is coming out in some weird way and mm -hmm. whatever you're writing so first I thought I was like thinking about teenagehood and like what it's like to kind of be a teenager in like the late 90s early 2000s like what were the super toxic like horrible messages that just were everywhere mm -hmm. and like you know we absorbed and and some you know, in some cases, like freely, like put back into the universe and, you know, how those have stayed with us or not hopefully stayed with us. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking about at first. And then at one, but I was kind of like, I was stuck because I was like, well, now what? Like, I don't want to write a book that's just about a teenager. And then, and then suddenly I was like, just writing a scene that was based on, you know, a Microsoft Word experience that I had had when I you know, was a temp at an engineering company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, in 2009. So I had moved with my 
now husband who had more of like a sort of trajectory in life. He was like, this is what I want to do. I applied to this, you know, grad program. It's in Pittsburgh. You know, I hope you'll come with me. And I was like, I work for a rare book dealer. Um, <laughs> and also mm-hmm. like in a baby and child consignment store. I'm sure. I'm, and I'm a <laughs> comp lit major and it's 2009. I'm sure I'm going to find a wonderful opportunity. Um, and yeah, so I just, that period of like, just applying so many times and being like, mm. I've taken the liberty of attaching my resume and your resume just like has just weird garbage and like <laughs> spare coins mm-hmm. and paper clips on it. And, um, and yeah, that, that feeling of flailing. And then when I did find a job, I, you know, was this temp and, um, and it was very much like, it was very kind of like the office, the show mm-hmm. type <laughs> vibes um but with but engineering and engineering is its own like specific world so i that really like i borrowed that from my own life and i'd say that that after that point is where bunny and i diverge and so then it's Mm -hmm. kind of like i think about how i felt in that job at a moment when it did feel like if i didn't make a commitment to this job and sort of try and excel in it then i would be lost because i would always just be cycling through like temp jobs of this nature and sort of like begging people to like deign to give me, you know, money to like read their emails for them because I felt like I had no marketable skills. Um, so that was like a feeling that I had really strongly. And, and I remember just sort of that, like watching other people who did seem to have more kind of a path forward or motivation or, whatever um and just being like well why don't like what am I doing Mm -hmm. (laughs) um so that that felt important and and I don't think I you know I think in that time period so let's see in 2009 you know I was like 25 and it was crucially that's when I started writing I was like started Mm -hmm. doing little blog posts about books at that time um and writing was the thing that ended up being sort of you know, I continued on like a professional trajectory and ended up going to grad school myself and something completely unrelated to writing. Um, but I was thinking like, like if, what if I didn't have that, you know, what if I mm-hmm. was like, okay, I like, I'm, if I'm going to work at this engineering company, reading these like reports that make no sense to me, like I'm going to be the best at it. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. um, so that's what I kind of gave bunny. And then I was like, and what would you, what, 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 what would you do if you just like, that's, how you know how the lay of the land um so that is a moment when i really sympathize with bunny it's just like totally you're like all right this is the job i'm doing um Mm -hmm. and then but yeah so what bunny decides to do after that is when i'm kind of like all right bunny like now now you're gonna dance for me (laughs) 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 Um. i'm so glad i'm not the only one who had like the weird jobs that are just totally unexpected like i worked in an amish restaurant and a Classic clock shop selling nutcrackers yes. with a guy who had a talking parrot. Your job was to sell nutcrackers? Yes. Okay. See, that I and I love work novels. Like I want to read <laughs> yes. all the all of every all the jobs in the world are so interesting. Well, um, the Golden State are. starts with someone yeah. leaving their <laughs> job. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um Geraldine Brooks on the front cover says that. This is um, a masterpiece of misdirection. And I find that to be particularly true and um, something I think you are very good at. And misdirection is hard to do. It's something that I really want to do and strive to do, but I never know if I'm like doing it, like doing it at all or doing it well or right. Um, So I'm just curious, like what do you think is the key ingredient to successfully um, intentionally misdirect your audience in fiction? Um, I... I will always be grateful for that like blurb that she yeah. did. Um, Cause I really, I like that way of putting it a lot. And, um, and, you know, I don't, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with sort of narrative distance. And that was the most important thing for me to establish as I started the book, because I, I had to start over a lot of times actually, because mm. I wasn't used to writing in the third person and the golden state is an incredibly voice driven book. So yeah you know, the voice, like, 
covers a multitude of sins in a way. I mean, that is if the voice is compelling to you. And if, you, if as a reader, you're like, well, I don't like this voice. So actually it covers no sins. The voice is the sin. But if you, you know, <laughs> if you were picking up what I was putting down, like um, in the first person, then that did a lot of work to kind of carry that plot forward. Mm -hmm. But I did not want to have a voice driven book in the same way for my second book. And I really wanted to figure out how to write in the third person mm -hmm. um, and in the past tense, because I, or the, the Golden State was also in the present tense, which is just bananas. Um, <laughs> but I, everything that I was starting with was felt way too kind of like arch and a little bit um, um, just too like facetious, like sarcastic. Mm. And I didn't want that because I don't think there's any point in writing like 400 pages about a character that you're just going to be like, well, this character sucks. And, you know, <laughs> everything about like, you know, this person is like sort of like a, a mean joke to me, mm. the the narrator, whoever that like figuring out who the third person is, is really important. But I also didn't want it to be a thing where, you know, whoever was narrating whatever like nameless third person was like very strongly allied with bunny. Um, I wanted there to be some distance for the reader to kind of like fill in and go in. And mm. um, so I really struggled with that, but I think that's where kind of the misdirection sits um, because the narrative does have to stick with bunny and empathize with bunny and like really share a lot about bunny. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also has to kind of hold back and, and, and at some moments sort of indicate that the narrative like, um, consciousness is broader than bunny's own consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's also risky because if you do that too much, then it's like straightforwardly polemical. And again, you're back in that, like, well, this person sucks. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think that is just boring. And when, so a book that I feel like really embarrassed to compare myself to this in any way, but just in terms of how to think about character and style um, was um, Madame Bovary was <laughs> very oh, yeah. helpful to me because you spend a lot of time with that character and it is I think kind of fundamentally irrelevant whether you like like or dislike wow. the character of Emma Bovary. Like I, I just, I mean, and yes, there's obviously lots to be said about like this male author's like representation of this woman and you know, whether that's fair or just or whatever. But again, I don't even, I really, to me, it does not matter as a reader because I was just so kind of caught up in what she was doing and what, what the consequences of those things would be. And, you know, sometimes you, you feel really sad for her and other times mm -hmm. you're like, well, this dumb bitch, like, what is she doing? <laughs> um, but, uh, but none of those, it's more just like, she is a, a character through which you experience her world. And so totally. you see like all these beautiful, beautiful set pieces where you're really just learning about a community and ways of thinking in that community. And that's what, what matters more than like what, you know, this heroine is doing or not doing. So that, that was kind of validating to me to just be like, you can use a character and care about them and be with them a lot, but you're also using them to do other things. Um, and it doesn't really matter. Like, and, and, and you can, yeah, I'm really straying from the misdirection, but I think because no. that sort of finding that narrative voice was so important. Um, and that's where, you know, the misdirection lives yeah. basically. Well, that, I, I find that interesting because uh, this idea of like balancing, like having um, empathy for this character and being like, what are you doing? <laughs> is really interesting and is the experience of Bunny because, and I think also in its own way is a misdirection because I think we expect um, plots to be particularly like bombastic in some way and so like I kept waiting for Bunny to like to get another job or to mm -hmm. but that's like not mm -hmm. her life and that's not her personality <laughs> and and that felt really realistic to me of like the the back and forth internally of being like do I do I like try harder to to move forward I feel really comfortable here I have a lot of freedom and that I think part of what I loved about reading the book was that uh the reality was such a a surprise as a reader because it just was like it, you never read this in books like it just felt very real to me thank you i yeah, love anyway. I, I love realistic fiction that me too <laughs> yeah um 
So you're a columnist in our September, October 2023 issue. And you mentioned something that I found really interesting and we've talked about a lot as a team, which was that the process of writing mobility was really different than the process of writing Golden State. And you've touched on that a little bit here. Um, I think a lot of authors and writers are given uh, advice to find like that one routine or one structure that is going to work for you to get the writing done. And I think that can feel kind of defeating for writers when they try to replicate that structure and it just doesn't work. Um, Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, I I have been like oppressed by the sort of butt in the chair, um, um, like axioms so much. And I mean, I do think there is definitely value in cultivating the ability to sometimes sit down and write when you don't feel like writing. That, yes, is very important. Um, But I, I with the Golden State, I had a timeline that was very firm. It was just like mm-hmm. an economic timeline. Like I, my family could afford for me to work only part time, doing like very lowly paid editorial work. Mm-hmm. You know, half the day and then half the day trying to write this book. You know, for a year and really not even a year. Like that was already there was a lot of creative math um, involved there. But so I was kind of like, well, and I felt so much just guilt that. I was able to do that or, and another thing is that, you know, I was writing that when I had a toddler and so I was paying. So the paid work that I was doing almost covered her daycare. And so I was just like, I am throwing money away, like for childcare that I'm, you know, who knows what will happen, you know, and there's a lot of like toxic, like um, internalized, like misogyny and so many things to unpack there, which I'm now mostly over and I'm all the way (laughs) over them, but um, at least regarding like paying for childcare when you're not necessarily like doing something. (laughs) Um, But I, so I felt like I had to work every day. I had a spreadsheet. I was like, this is the day, this is the date. This is the starting word count, ending word count. Hmm. And then if I didn't write, I had to like put the reason so I would, you know, have stretches where it was just like the date and zero and then like why. And so it'd be like dent disappointment or like child homesick or sometimes it was just like I couldn't like I sat there and I like scrolled yeah. Twitter and then I would really like just hate myself um, mm. for those days. You know, I did eventually I did finish the book like within the time horizon, but it it just felt like terrible um, mm. a lot of the time. <laughs> and then. I did a lot of flail, but I I felt very strong pressure to reproduce that experience when I started a new book. Um, a because just for financial reasons, you're like, yeah. okay, well, I need to finish a book again, so someone will hopefully give me money for it. You know, I have this momentum. If I don't do something with this momentum, I will squander it, and nobody will ever read anything. So I made, you know, I'm lucky that I have like a judicious agent. Or, and who was just kind of, so I would like send her pages and be like, maybe you could sell this. Like, maybe, this is like 10 pages. What if, what if someone was like, this could be a book? And she was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> she was like, you're not Stephen King or what, <laughs> like, you have to actually like write the book and then I will try to sell it, but you're doing great. You know, keep, <laughs> keep going. Um, so I did a lot of flailing and then we moved and just like mm. I had another child um, and every I just wasn't writing as much. Like mm-hmm. a lot of other stuff was intervening. I finally kind of got into a rhythm after we moved and I was like, okay, maybe, you know, I have like 30,000 words of something like this could be a book. And then the pandemic happened. Um, yeah, sure. And then I just, I didn't work on it for like, mm-hmm. you know, the first stretch, it was like, I didn't work on it for five months. I didn't open the document for five months because I had like little kids at home, mm-hmm. you know, it was a complete shit show. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go. I went and rented a cheap cabin. I stayed for three days. I opened the document. I wrote 10,000 words because by then I was desperate to write. I hadn't written in yeah. it so long. And and then I waited seven months after that. And then I did the same thing. And that second time was when I finally, I was like, ah, now I have momentum. I know what's happening. And I like went away a few more times, but it was very, like, I did not write every day. I did mm-hmm. not write like, and so now I'm just, I, I'm, I'm trying to like remember that I do enjoy writing every day yeah. and I, it's nice to have a practice. I don't want to always be writing in these like weird desperate scenarios where I'm like having a composting toilet and leaving my family, <laughs> but I could not have done this book without that. And I will always be grateful for mm. that time and experience. Um, 
so yeah, like you just have to work with the conditions you have. And so many writers I know are do are like, there are writers who just have full time jobs, mm-hmm. caregiving responsibilities, you know, of all different kinds. Sometimes multiple directions and generations, and they're also writing, and they're like, you know, doing exercises, like you know, yeah. and like <laughs> helping their communities. There's people who are just juggling so much, and yeah. I, it's just. But it doesn't really make sense to compare yourself to anyone because you have to write at your own sort of pace. And um, but yes, you have to balance that with like some days you just have to be like, okay, no, you must open the document. Yeah, you must try mm-hmm. and write something, even if it's yeah. just like a few words. Mm-hmm. I I think I'm going to use that. I'm going to internalize that because <laughs> so I wrote quite a bit for NaNoWriMo last year, and I haven't touched the document since. It's been swirling in my mind, and I've been thinking about it for months. So I'm going to, I'm hoping I'm going to be like you, and when I open it next, the words yes. will just flow out. Yeah, you'll be desperate to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and it's been, it's been yeah. marinating this whole time. That is, I, I mean, totally yeah. believe that. It's so part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we talked about the drafting part of it. I want to go back to what you were talking about earlier with the research part of things, yeah. because... So I, a big part of this is about the oil, oil and gas industry and the energy industry, and I'm fascinated by this. Um, and for as much as we've talked about, like Bunny's interiority, there is so much about this huge industry as well, um, and it c- covers things like all of the changing hands and renaming, re- rebranding to hide mm. all of these past misdeeds and to pretend <laughs> to be more environmentally friendly. And, you know, I can imagine the logos in my mind of these companies <laughs> <laughs> doing that exact, th- exact thing. So what kind of research did you do for this? And at what point in your drafting process did you start to incorporate that? I, I read a book that was very kind of influential in the writing process pretty early called the oil and the glory. Um, and then there's mm. a subtitle after that, but the main title is the oil and the glory. It's by a journalist named Steve uh, Levine. It's either I'm actually, I'm, I'm like, I've never said his name a lot. So it's either Levine <laughs> or Levine. Um, mm-hmm. But he used to be a Wall Street Journal journalist. And he wrote about this kind of like, it's often called like a gold rush for for oil. Um, in Baku in the mid or early 90s and even before when sort of the groundwork was being laid and the competition between uh, especially Chevron and BP to kind of get the major contracts for these oil reserves in Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan predominantly. And, And he does a great job of just kind of laying out the different personalities and such a good job that I was like that really for a minute, I was kind of like, I need to just like write a fictionalized version of all these mm. people. Um, because it does, I mean, I think the thing about oil and gas, which I'd say scholars and like, especially scholars, sort of interdisciplinary scholars, people who have like hybrid discipline disciplines are much more attuned to how many incredible, like narrative opportunity feels like sort of a perverse word in this context context but I really think it is like there are so many narrative opportunities and tributaries and ways to talk about fossil fuels and oil and gas that are just like being completely like squandered by by novelists (laughs) um not I mean many novelists write about oil and gas and do so in very interesting ways and you know there are a few contemporary novels that I read that I was like yes like more like Mm. this um but I think one of the reasons is that it's so overwhelming and it's so because it's really Mm a completely global industry and, and it has a lot of history, but it has like a lot of the history is very compressed in just a wild amount of stuff happened in a relatively Mm -hmm. short period of time. Um, that it's just hard to know how to tackle it. Um, and so Mm -hmm. I got really bogged down for a while because I was like, well, I'm just like, want to write this like big like multi all these characters like uh, this big oil story Mm -hmm. and then I just was like I can't I don't have the chops to do this as a fiction writer I just my brain doesn't think that way I don't know how to tell that story and also I think what's more what makes more sense for the way that I write and the kind of interests I have is to have it more sort of subterranean and just like woven in Mm -hmm. in a little bit of a different way and and sometimes I just let myself it felt sort of cheap to do this but if I was feeling overwhelmed or confused about the scale of it, I would just put that, I was like, well, Bunny can feel that way too, you know? So, totally. and, 
one of the ways that you can talk about it is to talk about how like vast and interconnected it is. Um, but so I, you know, read that book, went on this sort of direction that wasn't really going anywhere. I had to pull back, but then, you know, as I needed to think about Bunny's like future career as, you know, as she's becoming like a fully fledged adult and mm. like a professional woman, then I needed to jump back in. And so then I was spending a lot of time like watching YouTube videos of kind of conference presentations. I was reading LinkedIn. I have like so many fake LinkedIn like, I hate LinkedIn because it like won't let you look at stuff unless you're like a real person. So I have like my alter ego who is just seems very weird. But so I would just so I could like look at job listings and look at people's because there's just a whole world of yeah people and and be and because like it wasn't the kind of thing where I would feel comfortable finding someone who occupied some of these roles. Because it and be like, can I just follow you around? Because I'm going to write like a mean book about, <laughs> right. about what you that do. Expose you a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So that didn't quite feel right. So I did a lot of just sort of like, like identifying people who had roles that seemed similar and like reading their like LinkedIn posts. And, um, and I read a lot of scholarly books because there is a lot of amazing yeah. research about the oil and gas industry and a lot of like really cool kind of like, as I mentioned, like hybrid and like interdisciplinary thinking about it. And then, then just like a lot of amazing journalists and reporters mm -hmm. who are very doggedly covering this industry in a way, in a, in a media landscape that's like completely hostile and thankless. Um, so, and I thank them all in my acknowledgements to this yeah. book because, um, and I, and, you know, I sometimes asked people, I would like, you know, just be like, can you explain how this works to me? And sure. I, ha I have like literally like some textbooks about oil drilling. And what's funny is like, I still don't know. <laughs> I still don't know how it works. Some of the things I still, it's still confusing to me, but, but I think rather than like get bogged down in the technical details, like having just a sense of the vastness of the scale yeah. was what became important to me and trying to like convey that. Well, especially because it's like something that's happening almost the entire time under the surface of like the story we're reading, which is like Bunny's life and does help lead to like the larger picture, which is like climate change. Yeah. And um, without giving too much away, I just loved the ending of this book so much. It gave me chills. And um, I've been telling people it's like, it's like a quiet little surprise. And, but also it just feels totally inevitable when you like add up every aspect of the book and then you get to the end, you're like, yeah, this is, where we're at um yeah. I mean I we're at we're we're at it now oh, I mean, totally like, yes every day I'm just like well I should have made the ending worse like because I <laughs> you know it's just yeah I don't know I don't want to get too like doom doom you know no, totally but, but that's but but it's here and it's like yeah and sometimes I was so I resisted writing that ending for a little bit because I was like well it's too on the nose but then it's just like well why like what is the point of writing this if you're like everything can't be everything can't be so like behind the veil of Absolutely. like behind the curtain of like well I assume everyone knows like what's going to happen you know at some point it's yeah. like no well, like let's just let's just see a little bit of what it might look like or yeah well that's that was kind of my question was just like what did you did you feel yourself doing any sort of restraint with the ending and then in general like because it does feel like once you get to it, because it is a, I don't know, this is, you've kind of said this, it does jump in time. Yeah. And so the the jump from like where we're at right before the end to the end um, is equal parts like really subtle, but also, and, but also very realistic because these people are just trying to figure out a way to live in the world that they're in. And it isn't great. Like it's, people are dying actively because of the world we're in. So do you like... Did you did you ever feel wanting to be more I don't know dramatic about it and how much how much did you pull back? I'm I'm still torn about a lot of the stuff. I mean, there's there's I'm torn about a lot of things about the book. So first of all, mm -hmm. like yes, it's very understated um, the kind of future casting, and it could have been so much more extreme. Um, so the, in a way, I'm kind of like, well, am I like erasing that, like those realities? And at the same time, I all, but, but I, you know, my sort of commitment to the book was that it had to feel like true to yes. my, my 
pretty deep understanding of like this mindset of this particular like class and demographic of like when I see how you know I am like a I'm a white millennial woman and I it's been you know the older you get the more you see how how conditioned white millennial American woman I should say of like a certain class how sort of events and like political currents condition you if you are not do not actively resist to like go in certain directions and to and so I was thinking about just and then you know someone like that and then like someone who has resources and um I'm really (laughs) like rambling here but basically like I wanted to be true to that sort of that like kind of um type of person that I had imagined as Bunny's world. And then, so I thought a lot, I was very affected by, you know, I live in Portland and during Mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest um, heat dome of 2021, um, Mm -hmm. which was just like a really devastating and horrible, like thing to experience. And it's like, you know, a, a fraction of what people experience all the time, but like a lot of people died in the Pacific Northwest and, seeing the way that um, that just happened so swiftly and, and there's not, you know, and there was like a lot of bungling at the municipal level, um, the like cooling centers, you know, there were cooling centers open, but then the number that you were allegedly could call to get a ride if you didn't have a way to get there, they um, outsourced that to a third party and didn't tell them to be open on the weekend. So people were getting an after hours menu that just like went in circles um, and just like seeing things like that happen. And um, I had like my neighbor's chickens died and I had like had them in my freezer and just like all these sort of mo- gruesome things, you know? So that was, I was like, well, that's, that's the way I will convey this because that's like a person like bunny. That's probably like what she would see and feel because she's very insulated from the like direct, especially with something like um, heat, mm-hmm. you know, where you live, your your catastrophe depends on where you live, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so in the Pacific Northwest, you know, it's a sp- specific things that happen. So, um, yeah, I just tried to like kind of think about like how Bunny would experience that. But yes, I worried about sort of like erasing. I try, you know, I would gesture at what the broader sort right. of global experience is, but you know, really had kind of wrestled with that. And I was starting to say this before I got like si- sidetracked, but another thing that kind of gets erased is like the very active resistance to yeah. all of these things, um, which, you know, Bunny is not, but Bunny is like sort of peripherally aware that, people are doing things, but she is like a head in the sand type of person. Um, and so sometimes I was like, well, if this book, you know, had better like politics, it would, it would really be like highlighting the struggles that people are like past, present, future are, are like fighting against these outcomes. Um, but you know, I was like, well, that's, but that's a lot of people aren't doing that. (laughs) And that's like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I don't know. I, I, I struggled with what I felt was sort of like the right thing to do and what was mm-hmm. true to like the character and like world that I had decided to like um, uh, represent in the book. Totally. I think you're right. I think that the ending did feel appropriate for Bonnie yes. and her life and the character that, that she is throughout. Yeah. It felt in very that way, like, accurate. Uh, it's like in a real like study and subtlety and in that way it makes it feel very explosive and like I put mm-hmm. it down and I had like um just like a little bit teary eyed and I was talking to my husband and I was like that really like super made my stomach hurt and I was not anticipating it because it's so um the book up until that point follows a world that I exist in and then um very surprisingly uh, points to a world that I'm about to live in and I think the reality of it is what made it feel, I think, very urgent. Well, thank you. Thanks for, I mean, yeah. not to, like, sorry to be like, oh, thanks for being really bummed <laughs> out. But, um, but no, I mean, you know, I like, I had different, what, one of the first people that I gave the book to, who's like a writer, just a writer and also like my really close friend who I just respect her opinion so much. Yeah. And like the first, so she like read the whole thing. And then the first thing she said, she was like, 
do not cut the end no matter what anyone says. And, wow. and, I, and that was like very prescient because actually at one point I did mm-hmm. get some feedback that was like, I think maybe you could like lose the end. And I was just like, no, nope, I shan't. Yeah. <laughs> like, Cause otherwise Good. like why? And like, <laughs> I didn't know that it would be there until pretty late in the process. But then once it was there, I was like, no, it has to be there. Totally. I can't yeah. like, if I took it away, it would just feel so, yeah, it wouldn't feel right to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting here trying to imagine the right. book without that ending. And no, the, the, the whole book works because of totally. yeah, that ending. Yes. And narratively, it's <laughs> so fascinating. Cause it's like, right. Yeah, it's just really special. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I, I yeah. really, really loved the ending. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is very okay. validating. I'm yeah. like, like I'm so. Yeah. Ang- this is such an anxious period because you know the book comes totally. out in ten days. I have no idea what's gonna happen. You're like, you know, your publicist is like, well, hopefully, like people come to the event. Like you just don't know. And oh, so I so- actually almost when you posted your <laughs> book tour, I almost bought a ticket to San Francisco because I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I she's coming nowhere near Ohio. I've always wanted to go to San Francisco. Um, well, I would yeah. love to come somewhere near Ohio. So yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm still I'm hoping that like I mean you always hope that the book will kind of like have a longer tail than you know and mm-hmm. you know the Golden State like it's been now five years since it came out and like for a period it, I was kind of like oh I wrote that like that happened and you mm-hmm. don't hear anything about it but then recently I've had people write at me again and say oh you know what I just read this book and I really liked it and so you're like oh yeah. yes like things can not everything has to happen like in the first five minutes um yeah but I just want to say mm-hmm. it's so nice to talk with you all and like and just to it feels very like it feels um oh, nice to hear your amazing like feedback and questions okay. um, at this like vulnerable no. point. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right before, right. The ending of the golden state was also quite perfect. Yes. Like that. You're so good at that, endings. The, uh, that's, that moment like, <laughs> gave me so much anxiety <laughs> that, and which is I think what we're supposed to feel in that ending. Um, like, totally. Oh, I was like, this could really happen very close to where I live and I am not comfortable with that <laughs> but there are people living near me who would act this way <laughs> without giving totally. anything away but um. that's yeah thank you like endings to me are like a nightmare because I just like spend sure. so much time writing and have no idea what will happen and then to uh, to a certain extent you're especially with the golden state I was just like this could happen like you know and you feel like you're really you're just like i I would sometimes just be like closing my eyes writing like this no like this can't but then but then you're just like that's what books are like that's what Mm -hmm. storytelling is you just make shit up and sometimes it seems really goofy or like um i mean one book that i read that you know is like you know a modern classic at this point is um the great derangement by amitav ghosh and it's like Mm -hmm you know, it's a work of literary criticism and it's like basically like, you know, fiction writers are fucking up and not putting, you know, like Western, you know, canonical literary fiction writers are fucking up and not putting sort of climate things Mm -hmm. into their work. And there's a, there's a part of it that just talks about like kind of coincidence and, um, you know, sort of like unlikely things happening and, I, and it's not, I'm, I'm now, you know, it's been a couple of years since I read the book, but I remember just even that, like the book was meaningful to me in a lot of ways, but also that part, I was like, yeah, you can just have someone like run into someone else and it doesn't make sense that they would, but like, that's okay to do because you can, yeah, mm-hmm. you, you don't know, question it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's totally. what the book is. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for talking to us about, um, about mobility. I really thought it was fantastic and there's, there's a lot more about bunny that just really <laughs> resonated with me <laughs> well thank you because so of, much like for... you said the time period we live in <laughs> yes yeah yeah revisiting some of those i was like just mm-hmm. looking at looking at magazines and like just thinking about mm-hmm. the things that i so commonly just ingested as my media mm-hmm. and like cultural oh, diet yeah. at the time and i'm just like cultural Ew. diet wow like and also like literal diet yeah which is what yes. he talked about a lot like yeah one third less nut pringles are the thing of yes. my childhood I know. I actually felt I was kind of like, <laughs> I should put like a content warning in the book because there is so much of doubt, just like Bunny's preoccupation with kind mm-hmm. of weight and eating. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I like Bridget Jones's diary was a book that mm-hmm. I loved as oh, a yeah. teenager. And it's just like yep. pretty sickening now to me to think about how much of it is just like about 
like fat person's person. body. And, yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, well, again, <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> um, for all of our listeners, you can pick up your copy of Mobility beginning April, um, August 1st at your favorite bookstore. Thank you for joining Writer's Digest Presents. Join us next month when we will talk about how new AI developments continue to impact writers and other creatives. In the meantime, you can always find us at writersdigest.com and on social media at Writer's Digest. See you next time.